so much of what we want to accomplish, so much of what we want to do in this movement and in, in this country, I think are fundamentally dependent on going through a set of very hostile institutions, specifically the universities, which control the knowledge in our society, which control what we call truth and what we call falsity, that provides research that gives credibility to some of the most ridiculous ideas that exist in our country. And so I'm, I'm excited to close this conference with this particular set of remarks because I think if any of us want to do the things that we want to do for our country and for the people who live in it, we have to honestly and aggressively attack the universities in this country. Now, I am, uh, as of July of this year, a Senate candidate in the state of Ohio, which is a very unique situation for me to be in. Thank you. You can all go to jdvance.com and make yourselves as poor as possible to support my campaign. But, you know, one of the things that consistently comes up in my campaign, because I was one of these people who didn't quite get Donald Trump in the beginning, I didn't sort of fully appreciate where he was coming from or what he was about, and, and now I very much do, is this concept of red pilling. And if you ever heard this term, it comes from the movie The Matrix, which as I understand it, is made by a couple of people who do not share the politics of the people in this room. But the basic idea is that once you see the way that knowledge is transmitted, once you see the way that public policy works in this country, it's very hard to unsee it. And so there's this scene in the movie The Matrix where the, 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 the chief protagonist is given an opportunity to take the blue pill or the red pill. And he takes the red pill. And the red pill effectively reveals to him the fundamental corruption that laid at the heart of the society that he lived in. And I'm gonna come back to this analogy later on in my remarks, but I think it's important to understand that so much of what's going on in our country, uh, so much of what drives truth and knowledge as we understand it in this country is fundamentally determined by, supported by, and reinforced by the universities in this country. That is the world that we live in. We live in a world that has been made effectively by university knowledge. And you've asked yourself, why have we consented to this? Why have we accepted a world in which the universities, which by the way are not exactly politically sympathetic with any of the people in this room, why have we done that? The universities will make two claims. The first claim, what they provide for our society is that they provide for the dissemination of knowledge and truth. That's what the universities do. That's the first thing. And the second thing the universities do in this country is that they train young minds to think in innovative and thoughtful ways about the problems that we'll experience. Because no society can fully anticipate or appreciate what's about to come around the corner. And so it must train the next generation of leaders to know what the next problems will be, to apply first principles to those problems, and to eventually solve the issues that our society encounters. That is what the universities do, to disseminate truth and knowledge and to train the next generation of young minds. It's worth asking ourselves whether the universities today actually do that. Do the universities disseminate truth and knowledge? Do they train the next generation of young minds to actually anticipate the world as it is, to apply first principles to critical and difficult problems? And I think the answer is obviously no. That's obviously not what the universities do. But let me provide just a few examples here. So just today, actually, I logged onto Twitter, the worst website in the entire world, and I was introduced to a paper that was published by, you know, a professor's name I'd never heard in the University of Texas. And the basic argument that this professor makes is that many of the research outcomes in astrophysics and in other fields can be predicted by an artificial intelligence algorithm. This, this professor said, that if you want to actually predict what the next generation of academics will produce, one of the very useful tools is artificial intelligence algorithms. And it occurred to me, of course, that for so much of the past 10 or so years, we've been told that all the blue collar jobs will be replaced by artificial intelligence. And yet here's a professor telling us that the academic knowledge that exists in our society will be replaced by artificial intelligence. Of course, the professors reacted crazily to this. A pogrom started on social media. The guy was turned into the great Satan. And I have to bring out my, you know, my phone here to remember the exact thing that was, that was said here. But today, the professor who published this paper 
issued the following apology. Let me just read it. I apologize most humbly and sincerely for the stress that I have caused with the PNAS preprint. The paper and my book on using metrics of research impact to help inform decisions on career advancement. My goal was entirely supportive. I wanted to promote fairness and concreteness in judgments that are now based uncomfortably on personal opinion. I wanted to contribute to a climate that favors good science and good citizenship. My work was intended to be helpful, not harmful. It was intended to decrease bias and to improve fairness. But of course, according to the mob, his research did nothing of the sort. It promoted bias and promoted unfairness. And so this person has to propose this ridiculous apology. Now ask yourself, what is the purpose of a university that responds to a paper with that kind of reaction? What is the purpose of a university that is theoretically promoted, or sorry, dedicated to truth and knowledge, looking at a paper like that and saying, you know, this is totally unacceptable. This person must apologize. Now here's another remark that I wanna, I wanna bring you, your attention to. About a year ago, and I don't have the, the details exactly correct, but about a year ago, there was a series of protests around surrounding the, the death of George Floyd, which of course was a terrible tragedy. I personally find the fact that our entire society was destabilized by it for a generation ridiculous, but we are where we are. It was a terrible tragedy. And our public health authorities last summer, remember we're still in, even in most relatively pro-freedom states, we're still in the midst of lockdowns. And what did 1,200 public health authorities all across our country say about the anti-economic devastation protests? Well, they said this. First of all, the anti-racism pro racism protests, the protests that issued from the death of George Floyd, they should not be confused with a permissive stance on all gatherings. Of course, the protests against racism and against the death of George Floyd are totally justifiable under our sincerely objective public health rubrics. But protests against stay-at-home orders are rooted in white nationalism. Now this is 1,200 of our leading public health authorities all across this country. Now think for a second about all of the ways in which our universities transmit not knowledge and not truth, but deceit and lies. About 18 or so months ago, I don't remember the exact date, but a paper came out suggesting that gender transition surgeries and hormonal therapies for adolescents who were experiencing gender dysphoria was in fact good for our society. That the people who underwent these treatments were benefited in various mental health ways. They had lower anxiety, lower risk of suicidal ideation, and so forth. But what was obvious at the time to people like Michael Regnerus was that the data on which this study was based was ridiculous. Now, of course, the mainstream press and all of our elite institutions reproduced this information as if it was the gospel truth. And yet there were a few courageous souls who said the data on which this study is based is fundamentally ridiculous. In fact, if you look at the data produced by the, the people who created the study, what it found is that there was no benefit to gender reassignment surgery. There was no benefit to hormonal therapy for adolescents. Indeed, the risk of suicidal ideation and the risk of mental health problems actually went up if you looked at the data seriously and honestly. Now the people who called this out at the very beginning were of course called homophobic, transphobic. They were deplorable. They were unacceptable in our modern society. And yet the institutions that are theoretically dedicated to the transmission of truth and knowledge held this up as the gospel truth even as it was a lie. And it was not just a lie, it was a lie that led to increased suicide rates among our young girls and increased confusion among kids all across our country. Ladies and gentlemen, the universities do not pursue knowledge and truth, they pursue deceit and lies, and it's time to be honest about that fact. Now we could go issue by issue, example by example. I've recently become obsessed. I'm an alumnus of Yale Law School. 
at the ridiculous, thank you, <laughs> boo. I, I've, I've recently followed the ridiculous situation at Yale Law School, which when I was there was clearly a liberal biased place, but I went back there and gave a speech in 2018, and it felt genuinely totalitarian, right? It felt like the sort of place where if you were a conservative student who had conservative ideas, you were terrified to utter them, terrified of being socially ostracized, terrified of getting bad grades from your professors. And recently, what we've learned is that a young student who invited a bunch of students over to his house in a joking way has been threatened by the diversity bureaucracy at Leo Law School. Literally threatened that his bar examination might receive a negative approval, his, his, his character and ethics examination might receive a negative appraisal from the law school because he dared joke about some of the ridiculous progressive orthodoxies that exist on our campuses today. Now think about that. Think about what it means, not just to be made fun of or to be criticized by your peers, but to have the diversity administrators at one of the best law schools in the country literally threaten you that you might not even be able to pass the bar examination because you told a joke in a way that was offensive to progressives. That is the world in which we actually live, ladies and gentlemen. That is the universities that we actually occupy. That is the unfortunate situation in which truth and knowledge in our country actually reveals and disseminates itself. Now we ask ourselves, this is ridiculous, of course. I imagine that I don't have to convince any more of any of you that this is preposterous, that the universities in our country are fundamentally corrupt and dedicated to deceit and lies, not to the truth. But, but ask ourselves, why is this true? Why is it? that our universities are so committed to some of the most preposterous dishonesties in the world instead of committed to the truth. And my argument here is that it's about power. So I want to talk to you just a lot about a few of the people who are affected by the lies that are told in our universities. So right now, if you are a lower class person in our country of any race and you want to live a good life, very often the story that you're told is that you must go to a college or university. If you want to live and work in a middle class life, you must go to a college or university. Ladies and gentlemen, who does that benefit? Who benefits from being told they have to go and acquire 60, 70, 80, $200,000 of student debt to live a good life in our country? The f That's right. The fundamental lie of American feminism over the past 20 or 30 years is that it is liberating for a woman to go and work 90 hours a week in a cubicle at Goldman Sachs, shipping her fellow countrymen's jobs off to a regime that hates them, and that is liberation compared to the problems of family and patriarchy in our modern society. Think about environmental justice, a term that you'll hear if you're ever on a university campus these days, where the net result of the policy of environmental justice is to ship a large number of manufacturing jobs off to the dirtiest economy in the world, that's China and frankly India as well, in exchange for the good feeling that you have done something for climate change, when in reality, if you're shipping millions of manufacturing jobs off to China, you're making our planet dirtier, not cleaner, and the people who lose their jobs in the process have a right to complain about it. Think about critical race theory. Thank you. And what does it mean for our leadership to learn that the way to rectify racial injustice in this country is to put a black graduate of the Harvard Business School on the board of Morgan Stanley instead of to invest in black communities all across our country, or frankly, white communities all across our country. That is the ideology that comes from our universities. And what is the net effect of it? What is the purpose of it? Where does it come from? The simple fact is that our universities tell the powerful what they want to hear and they couch it in ridiculous political rhetoric instead of dealing with the real consequences of progressive policy. <laughs> Say you're a middle class Ohioan where I'm running for Senate right now 
and you're worried about the fact that your heating bills this winter look to go up by 50 or 60 percent, say you're worried about the fact that your grocery bills, your gasoline bills are skyrocketing even as we speak, ladies and gentlemen, don't dare complain about it because, didn't you know, the person who has implemented these policies is the first female Treasury Secretary, Secretary of the United States. She's a great trailblazer. Who cares that you can't afford basic necessities for your family? The universities tell us that so long as we're trailblazing on diversity, equity, and inclusion, it doesn't matter if normal people get screwed. All that matters is progressive orthodoxy and whether our society reinforces it. This is the world that we live in. And I hate to say, this is the world created by universities that care more about fake culture wars that care more about identity politics, that care more about diversity, equity, and inclusion than they do their own society and they do the people who live in it. <laughs> Critical race theory, which, just to take a brief segue, may very well elect Glenn Youngkin governor of Virginia tonight. I heard somebody say he won. Uh, I remember a similar feeling about a year ago, certain that my guy won. And it, and it, and it, and it turned out, it turned out that there was some, some toilet problems in the late night counting. So I certainly hope that Glenn Youngkin wins. And if frankly, if we lived in an actual first world country, we would know by 11 o'clock tonight. And I will be toasting Glenn Youngkin's victory this evening. But really ask yourself what critical race theory does and what its purpose is. Right now, in American schools, there are millions of children who are learning about the fundamental evil of American slavery and America's racist past. And of course, we have a complicated past and there are a lot of sins that we have to atone for. But ask yourself why American children are learning about America's racist past 180 years ago instead of the fact that this very moment there is a major multinational corporation named Apple that is employing slaves in China, not 180 years ago, ladies and gentlemen, but right now, this very moment. And you realize that progressive politics, it's not about uplifting minorities, it's not about healing our planet, it's not about looking after the poor. Progressive politics is a language, a language used by our new oligarchy to do two things. On the one hand, to rob the American people blind, and on the second hand, to tell them to shut the hell up about it if they dare complain. That is the purpose of American progressive politics. That is its net effect. And that is the ideology that is reinforced, that is given legitimacy, and that is taught at our universities. Why, ladies and gentlemen, are school children learning from school teachers that America is a fundamentally racist and evil country? Because those same school teachers learned it from some progressive professor at a university 10 or 15 years ago. That is the fundamental problem of American truth and knowledge today. We create, we have created a system where to work in the modern economy, to live a middle class life, you have to go to a university. That is what our elites tell our young people. And yet at those universities, they are told that working with your hands is looked down upon. They are told that America is a fundamentally racist and evil country. They are taught the children who go through this university system that this country built by our fathers and grandfathers is an evil and terrible place. Ladies and gentlemen, we are giving our children over to our enemies and it's time we stop doing it. Now somebody mentioned Anthony Fauci and I, you know, didn't mean to talk about Anthony Fauci, but of course I'm going to because why not? It's so easy, right? And I'm a Senate candidate. Why not bring up Anthony Fauci? But you ask yourself, what is the claim of authority that Anthony Fauci has? We didn't elect him. I hope, I hope no person in here voted for Anthony Fauci. 
We didn't do anything to make him the Lord over our entire economy and our, over our entire social lives. I saw recently that he said that if you want to hang out with your family over Christmas, two years after the beginning of the pandemic, you should make you and your children wear masks. We didn't, no, no person in this room, no person in our country gave Anthony Fauci this authority. No person in this country gave the 1,200 public health authorities who issued that ridiculous letter authority over our country. Where does their authority come from? It comes from the piece of paper that hangs up in the office walls of every single one of them, the university diploma. And we subsidize, we support, and in our own ways, all of us, reinforce the power of universities to control our lives and control how we live them. I was doing a donor event not, not too long ago, encouraging people to support my campaign, which is of course an important part of being a political candidate. And I, I, I was talking with a person about how ridiculous it is, is it that we tell our young people to go to college, to get brainwashed, to acquire 60, 70, $80,000 of student debt just to be able to live a normal life in their own country. And he said, well, what's the alternative? The donor at this, at this meeting, a, a politically aligned person, a person who's supporting my campaign said, well, what's the alternative? I don't want my kid to become an HVAC specialist. But if that's your attitude, ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna to continue to empower the college the colleges and the universities that make it impossible for conservative ideas to ultimately carry the day. We have got to get out of the mindset that the only way to live a good life in this country, the only way for our children to succeed is to go to a four-year university where people will learn to hate their country and acquire a lot of debt in the process. That is a necessary component of our ideas ultimately carrying the day. Now, I only have seven or so minutes left, so I, I want to leave you with, with a couple of thoughts here. The first is, I believe, Yoram, correct me if, if I'm wrong, I don't see you, but th this is the last public speech of this conference. Is that right, Chris? All right. All right. Well, I just want to make this really awkward and end us on a, on a very awkward, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> but I, I want to encourage us, and I know there have been a lot of discussions, some of which I've been able to participate in or at least watch, some of which I haven't participated in, about what is national conservatism. And I want to leave us with, with the thought that if national conservatism means anything, it means standing for the people in this country who have been screwed over the last 30, 40 years. I want to call your attention to, to three people. Three people all from Ohio, I'm biased, obviously I'm an Ohio guy and I've uh, been campaigning in Ohio the last few months. But three people in the state of Ohio who I think, you know, they, they might not read the same books that we read, they might not speak the same language that a lot, of, a lot of you speak about politics and political theology, but they're good people. And they want to live a good country in, the, in, in this place that their fa fathers and grandfathers built. So one is a woman who cares a whole lot about the immigration issue. I met her in southwestern Ohio probably three months ago. And she really cares about the southern border because she's probably 55 or so years old. And she's caring for a young grandbaby, just like as, as any of you have read my book know, my grandparents cared, and cared for and raised me. She is raising a grandbaby that she didn't anticipate to raise because the opioid epidemic that is spread all across this country took her daughter from her, and she did the incredibly honorable thing of taking her own grandchild, even though she didn't have a whole lot of money lying around, into her home to raise and support that child. Now the left tells a story that the, woman, the reason this woman cares about our ridiculous and porous southern border is that she's a racist, she's a xenophobe, she doesn't like Mexicans. That's why she doesn't want a criminal gang controlling the U.S. southern border. But what if I told you that the fentanyl that's currently pouring across our southern border destroyed and killed her child? What if I told you that that same fentanyl is currently running rampant in the community that she calls home? And what if I told you that the reason she wants to close the southern border is not because she hates Mexicans, but because she loves her grandbaby, and she wants that grandbaby to grow up in a community where safety and security and community run wild, not fentanyl overdose?
I also want to tell you about a young father who pulled his 11-year-old daughter in northeastern Ohio out of her school. Northeastern Ohio is where Cleveland and Youngstown are, for those of you who are un uninitiated. And he pulled his 11-year-old daughter out of high school, sorry, out of elementary school, because she came home for a week, five days in a row, literally sobbing, because she was being told by her teacher that she, because of her white skin color, was an oppressor, and that many of the other children in her classroom were victims. Now the left, when we talk about critical race theory, says first of all, it's not taught in our schools, which we now all know is ridiculous. But they'll say that the, 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 the desire here is to try to correct historical wrongs. We're trying to uplift our black citizens. And yet, this 11-year-old girl, her best friend in class, was a little black girl. And she was sad for two reasons. First, because her teacher was telling her because of her skin color she was a bad person. And I don't care if we're talking about a little black girl in 1965 or a little white girl in 2021. Telling a little girl that she's evil because of her skin color is disgusting and vile. And as a Christian, I'd say satanic. But she was most sad because her best friend in class, ladies and gentlemen, I mean, think about this. Her best friend in class, when they did their separation into victim and oppressors, she was in the oppressor group and her best friend was in the victim group. What is it that we're dealing with when our adults tell 11-year-old girls not to love their fellow citizens, not to build friendships with them, but to put them in one box as they put themselves in another box? That's what we're dealing with in this country. And as we talk about ideas and we talk about the importance of freedom and liberty and classical American traditions as we talk about national conservatism, as it says on the banner. I hope that you will remember that the reason we fight, the reason that we do what we do, I, I hate to say it, I love all of you. I mean, I've, I've met many of you and some of you even bought me a drink. It's, it's not for ourselves. It's for the grandma taking care of her grandbaby. It's for the young father whose little girl just wants to build a friendship with a person because they're both children of God and not members of separate groups, victim and oppressor. Ladies and gentlemen, we fight for the American nation and we fight for the people who live in it. Now, I, I, I want to close out here, and my timer says that I have 50 seconds, though I assume if I go a little bit over, it's not going to ding me or... You know, give me some ridiculous sound, but you know, I, I, I thought a lot, more than any, you know, I, one of the things you do as a politician, and I hate to say this, but I guess I'm a politician now, I'm running for office asking for people to vote for me. One of the things that you do is you go out and you give speeches, and you ask people to vote for you, and you talk to them about the problems that you care about, and you hope they agree with you. And I thought a lot, more than any speech I've ever given, about the way to close this out, partially because I'm the last person speaking this evening, and this is such a wonderful conference, and congratulations to all of you for participating and putting it on. But also just because, you know, this is a great moment in our country's history. We're all figuring out what the conservative movement will be in this new decade. We're all participating in it. And I thought to myself, you know, I, I really want to really end this on an inspirational note. And so I looked at scripture, and I looked at, you know, some of the great holy fathers and saints of the, of the church, thought about some of the great heroes of Western civilization. And of course, I thought about some of the great American leaders. And the person whose quote I ultimately had to land on was the great prophet and statesman, uh, Richard Milhouse Nixon. <laughs> and I have to say, before I get to this, that we are celebrating today the birthday of Pat Buchanan, who first, who first got a start in the Nixon administration and I think is the genesis of many of the ideas that we discussed here and have discussed here over the past few days. But Richard Nixon, not known for his inspirational quotes, and I'm not going to lie to you, 
I'm not going to offer you an inspirational quote tonight. I'm going to offer you a true quote because there is a season for everything in this country. And I think in this movement of national conservatism, what we need more than inspiration is we need wisdom. And there was a wisdom in what Richard Nixon said approximately 40, 50 years ago. He said, and I quote, the professors are the enemy. <laughs>